So I'm now going to look at chapter three, which is about person-centred care in health and social care. Now, for those of you who have done the childcare course and the ones who have done the health and social care course, um, or currently doing it, um, you have looked at person-centred care already in the introduction to um, health and social care and child care, etc. So we're now going to look at it a little bit more in a little bit more in depth. We're going to look at um, care plans and um, how it, we'll have some scenarios in here where we will look at um, you know what person-centred care these particular individuals in these scenarios will be needing. The aims and objectives of today's session. So by the end of the session, you will have described skills and qualities needed to give personal care. You will identify procedures relating to personal care. You will explain why procedures relating to personal care must be followed. And you will look at case studies describing the personal and emotional needs of individuals of varying age groups looking at children and adults. So the first slide, person-centred care troubleshooting. So sometimes you have to think outside of the box. If you're working in a nursing home where every service user needs personal care and a member of staff is called in sick, you may need to have you may have to think in different ways to meet the individual needs. So for example, if you're getting the um, getting them ready for breakfast being served in the lounge and you need everybody there at a certain time and you're a member of staff down then you are going to need um, longer to obviously to get the, everybody ready to be there on time. So you may have to have only time to clean one area of each person's body before getting them to the lounge for breakfast. So for a few moments, think about which area would you clean if you've woken up somebody and you're getting them ready to go and have their breakfast and you needed to prioritise to be there on time, what, uh, which area would you clean first? So just have a think about that for a few moments. And also to help you think about this, um, if you were actually a service user and the staff only has time to wash one area of your body, which area would you choose? So for example, would you want your face wiped, your, your down below wiped, your hands, your arms, your neck? So have a think about that also for a few moments. So usually, if we're in a classroom environment, we'll have a, you know, we'll ask each and everybody um, which area you would prefer to use. And from experience, um, quite a lot of people say they would actually want to have their their hands washed um, as their uh, and face, hands and face. But you know, especially the hands as they're going down for breakfast, and they will be maybe using their hands to to eat their breakfast. So, um, you know, it's an interesting one, but it's something for you to be thinking about. So, again, we've looked at personal care, but, we, you know, we're going to go through again, what is personal care? And personal care is a broad term used to refer to supporting um, individuals with personal hygiene, toileting, along with dressing and maintaining personal appearance. It can cover, but is not limited to, so it can cover bathing, showering, including bed baths. So we're now going to look at privacy and dignity and look what, what, what it So privacy, giving someone space when and when they need it. Dignity, so focusing on the value of every individual, including respecting the views, the choices, the decisions, not making assumptions about what they want, how they want to be treated, working with care and compassion, communicating directly with the individual whenever possible. So, you know, we, we said on the last slide about putting yourself as the service user, and it's really important to put yourself there because you're going to be working with people. And, you know, you've got to think yourself, how do you want to be treated? Um, do you want people to respect your views, your choices, your decisions? You know, making assumptions. So not just assuming that you, um, that you, you'll eat eggs for breakfast because you might not like eggs. You, you know, it's about having that choice. You might not want eggs that morning for your breakfast. So it's really important that you think about these things. 
you know, working with care and compassion, I mean, that speaks for itself, doesn't it? You know, we want people to care. We want the compassion. We want an understanding. Um, you know, these people, these individuals that you're going to be working with, you know, they're not all there, um, I say by choice, but they're not all there by choice. It's, you know, it's their situation at, at their, their stage in life or, or the whole life they, they may have to be really cared for. So it's really important that we treat people, every individual, with care and compassion and, and also communicating directly with the individual whenever possible. So that's really important. You know, talk to that person. Sometimes we can be a bit frightened um, if, um, you know, if someone is not able to communicate verbally, well, they'll find other ways, but it's still important that we actually speak to that individual and try and get as much information as we possibly can. And these sort of things come sometimes with time once you do get to know these people. You know, it's not always going to be over a long time, but you may, um, depending on the job that you choose, you may work with these individuals on a regular basis, so you will build that relationship and you will find ways um, of best of communicating. But it's still important that you do directly communicate, even to somebody that you've never met before, you know, find out what their needs are and communicate with them as much as you possibly can. And privacy and dignity, um, so, you know, it's the centre of a person's well-being. And as far as possible, you should get to know each individual, like I said before, the background, the ideas, the wishes, the likes and the dislikes. And I know we've looked a lot of, a, a lot of around this um, when we were looking at the other um, health and social care um, units. You should always provide personal care and support. That puts the individual at the centre of the care, enables them to be as independent as possible and respect their privacy and dignity. So, you know, working in a way that reduces the risk of an individual being treated in a way that's degrading or harmful. So, you know, that's making sure that um, the, um, you know, you may have a curtain around somebody if they're wearing a gown, um, they're wearing a dressing gown um, over the top of it so that, you know, sometimes the gowns are open at the back. Um, making sure that if you're giving somebody a wash, a bath, you're getting them dressed and you're in the room, their room, you know, that the door's not wide open for everybody to see. So that's really important um, that you do, that you think of these things. So we're now going to look at how we respect privacy. So, you know, there's some examples here um, of ways that you should protect privacy. So always ask individuals before touching them in any way. Again, it, it's so important, we said it before, about communicating. We need to find out, so we need to actually ask the individual. We're going to look a little bit later in, into care funds, and you know, when you are working with individuals, there will be care funds in place, and it's really important that you do read those um, care funds and find out um, about um, individuals. One of the um, units on the last uh, qualification is looking at autistic spectrum condition, and some of the um, indicators that you need to be aware of. And, you know, touching people without actually asking um, can trigger certain behaviours, so it's really important that you do communicate and ask them um, before. Knocking on the door, speak before you enter. Um, again, a really important, you know, again, we're thinking again, how would we expect to be treated? We wouldn't want somebody just to walk in. You know, knock on the door, hello, making sure, you know, that it, 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 it's okay for you to enter. Um, if your role involves um, supporting individuals to wash or dress, make sure you protect their dignity. And um, I've said this before, didn't I, about curtain screens or doors properly closed to respect them. Um, hospital gowns, which I've already talked about in the last slide. And um, if someone needs support to go to the toilet, they should not have to wait to be left too long for you to return. Um, and, and also, if they need to go to the bathroom, to the toilet, you know, they may ask you, you need to take them as soon as possible because, um, you know, they might end up having an accident if you don't take them as soon as you can. And then if you take them to the bathroom and you're leaving them there, you know, it's just not acceptable. So there, there are some things that, you know, you need to think about when you're respecting um, privacy for individuals. So we're now going to look at promoting dignity. And promoting dignity of all individuals, they should, again, it, you know, it's 
quite repetitive, but they should be involved in every decision that affects their care, including personal decisions. So, for example, you know, what they eat, what they wear, what time do they go to bed, um, and why the decisions about their care or support. And again, this is another um, little exercise that we do sometimes in the classroom. Uh, for everybody, just have a think, what time do you go to bed? You know, or um, what time do you have a shower? Or do you have a bath? Do you have a shower bath in the morning, a shower or bath in the evening? And what time do you go to bed? And this is, you know, the reason I'm asking you to think about this is um, usually, you know, I'm sure um, you'll, we may have uh, differences of what time you go to bed. I actually go to bed quite late, but I know some people, like my husband, sometimes he goes earlier than me because he prefers to. So what we're thinking about promotions of the dignity is if, um, you know, if you say that everybody needs to go, right, 10 o'clock now, everybody's going to bed, and somebody actually prefers to stay up later, it's not fair, you know, you're not giving them um, the right care because, you know, you shouldn't have to go to bed just because everybody else is going to bed. And sometimes an individual may not be able to understand and may not be able to make a decision or communicate their choice. And if this is the case, they may lack the mental capacity to make the decision. And the individual may be able to make day-to-day -day decisions, for example, what to wear and what to eat, but not be able to make complex decisions. So, for example, about money or medical issues. So they're important to be thinking about as well. And then, um, you know, just on the other side, so a lack of privacy privacy and a lack of dignity, so here's some examples, so a lack of thought given to help people with their personal appearance, the attachment of labels to older people, so for example bed blockers or geriatrics, exposing a patient's naked body to strangers or to other patients when using a hoist, not asking the person how he or she would like to be addressed, mixed sex wards, lack of thought being given to the gender of the carer, and mixing tablets into food if they're declined, um, you know, if it, if they decline it, it's their choice. So we're now going to look at skills and qualities that are needed when working in care. And this is your first going to link to your first question. And your first question is asking you to look for three skills and um, three qualities, okay? And you're going to describe why they're needed, okay? So, when we're thinking of skills and when we're thinking of qualities, here's a tip for you. So, a skill is something you can do already. You can do. So, easy. For example, I can dance, I can sing, I can draw. And a quality is something you are. So, for example, I am kind, I am nice, I am polite. So, there's some examples. So, you're going to read through the next two slides and I'm going to talk you through them as well. And they're going to support you in answering question five, uh, question seven, sorry, uh, which will be on page thirty-one. Okay. So here are some examples of skills for personal care. So hair care. So obviously, when you're working with people, um, service users, you most probably will be having to do people's hair. So you know, hair care is a skill that you need to be able to do. So making, pers making it personal by styling it how the service user likes it, using the hair care equipment, so shampooing, conditioning, combing, brushing, maybe using a hair dryer. It's really important, you know, that's a good skill that you need to have to be able to do that. Oral care, so ensuring the service user's mouth are clean and fresh. So you were brushing the teeth in the morning, at night, or when requested. So again, it's another skill that you need to be able to do. Denture care, so cleaning them using denture solution. And um, dentures must be brushed and checked for cracks each day. Must be placed in the service user container at night. Skin care, so we must check the integrity of the skin, check for sores, wounds, thinning skin and rashes. Bathing, we've talked a lot about bathing, but you know we need to encourage independence, but also offer assistance when required. Be on hand to reach areas that you know they can't, and you can bathe service users in a bath or in the bed, but again, independence in all these areas is important, you know, ask, you know, when we're doing hair, brushing teeth, see if people can do it, you know, don't just do it for them, find out if they can. Maintaining privacy and dignity, again, we've talked about, 
but you know, allowing them to keep the usual standard of personal hygiene, giving them a choice of clothing, involving in the decision relating to their care. And some examples of qualities for personal care. So gentleness. So we need to be caring and gentle when giving personal care because otherwise we may be too rough and hurt people. Empowering. We need to promote that independence as much as possible for the elderly. We need to maintain their level of independence for people with learning difficulties. We need to teach them independence in personal care. And, you know, by giving them the praise and the support to be independent, we will empower them to, you know, to want to have a go and want to do it and continue to do it for as long as they possibly can. Be non-judgmental. So everybody's different, with, you know, different in shape, in size, scars, colour, body hair, etc. And as carers, we mustn't be, you know, we must not be, we must be non-judgmental, sorry, when helping others with personal care requirements as we need to be professional and that's important. We need to be respectful, so we must respect the wants and the needs of people as we all have preferences of what we like and what we and dislike, whether it's how we want our hair, what soap we use, or if we do not want a full bath every day. So you know there are these, these are some of the qualities that, that are needed for working in personal care. So we're now going to look at procedures, okay? And this moves us on to the next question, question number eight. And um, it's asking you to identify procedures relating to person-centred care that need to be followed um, in a setting. And for each procedure, you need to explain why it's important that it's followed. So what procedures must be followed when turning a service user over in bed? So I want you to, to have a look at these and think about them before you move to the next slide what the answers are. What procedures must be followed to ensure we do not pass on germs from one service user to the next? What procedure must be followed to protect ourselves when carrying out personal care? And what procedure must be followed when we are completing care plans? So the procedure we must follow when turning a service user in bed is manual handling, the manual handling procedure. The procedure that we must follow to ensure we do not pass on germs to one another um, to the service user on to the next is hand washing. The procedure we must follow to protect ourselves when carrying out personal care is self protection. And the procedure we must follow when, when we are completing care plans is confidentiality. And we're going to talk a little bit more about these in the next slide. So these are the procedures that you need to, it's asking for three of them, three procedures to identify so you can choose from um, three from, from, from these examples. Or if you want to find some more of your own, that's absolutely fine. So the next um, part of the question is asking you why the procedure needs to be followed. So manual handling. So manual handling for health and safety. It must be followed so that the service user can be lifted and moved safely. We must be trained in manual handling before we move on with the service user. And that is really important. If we start a job and we are asked to move somebody, a service user, and you haven't had manual handling training, then you need to, you know, you need to tell somebody that you can't do it because if you do it, you could hurt the service user, you could hurt yourself. So it's really important that you do follow the procedures before you um you lift anybody. Hand washing. So hand washing is important during personal care because it supports infection control. It stops germs from spreading, including MRSA. And obviously, with the current climate that we're that's what's happening currently, the COVID-19, the coronavirus, um, hand washing plays a massive part in protecting ourselves um, from spreading the um, the uh, the coronavirus. So that's important. Self-protection. So we must wear personal protective equipment, which we hear it's called PPE, when dealing with bodily fluids to prevent the spread of contamination, including infections. And also, you know, with regards against the current situation, the current virus, COVID-19, um, the PPE, um, again, you know, we must, we must wear it. We've got to wear it. It's been, you know, it's there to protect us. Um, and we hear, you know, obviously there's quite a lot about this in the, in the news with the current situation and a shortage in PPE. But, you know, we must always wear it. If, if there isn't any there, then again, like the manual handling, you know, we need to tell someone we can't do that job unless we've got the right equipment to do that job. So that is important. 
confidentiality. We must maintain confidentiality at all times, you know, when completing care plans because of data protection and the GDPR. And we've looked at confidentiality over the last few sessions also, to, um, you know, why it's important that we do maintain confidentiality. So the final part of the question is asking what may happen if the procedure is not followed? So we've, I've talked a little bit about it, but if we do not follow, ma follow manual handling training, we can incorrectly use the hoist um, and hurt ourselves, the service user or our colleagues. If we do not wash our hands properly between service users, we can spread infection and viruses to other service users or to ourselves or our colleagues. If we do not wear personal protective equipment, PPE, when dealing with bodily fluids, and get infected and obviously liability insurance will not be valid and if we do not maintain confidentiality and write about another service user the company will be fined and the individual will be disciplined so there's some of the points that you need to um, be looking at when you answer the final part of this question um, and i want you now you click on this video link here and um, it's um it's a real life story about um, a young girl who was involved in an accident and was paralysed, and um you know it shows you her story and um, yeah just have a look at it and then um, you know it, just, it really gets you thinking you know um she's gone through a lot but she's got lots of people who have supported her and helped her become stronger. So what I want you to do next. So we're going to look at the next. Um, and you're going to read the following case studies. So you're going to be looking at two children, one adult and one elderly adult. And you are going to also read about Jan and I've given you some examples um, to help support the answers for when you're looking at the other scenarios. And, um, you know, while you're looking at uh, through these scenarios and thinking about what their needs are, you know, personal care needs of individuals, so including washing, Dressing, feeding, toileting, emotional needs of individuals, so thinking about respect, privacy, dignity, choice, independence, all these things we've talked about over the over the last um you know, some of the last sessions and also looked at them earlier on in this in on, on the earlier slides for this this unit as well. This chapter. So what you need to do, you need to read the scenario, okay? To read each one and for each one you need to describe using at least three sentences because it's asking you for a description so at least three sentences for each the personal and the emotional needs of each one you can use the example on the next slide and i'll talk you through them for yan to support your answers so you can see how you know we'll look at yan and look at what the needs of yan are and then when you're looking at the other ones, you can sort of look at, you know, use those ideas to think, what am I actually looking for? What are the needs? So Jan is 22 years old and has recently moved into a house share with another young female called Sharon. They have 24 hour care in their home via one-to-one -one support workers who work shifts. Jan goes to college every day. Jan has Down syndrome. She needs prompting to go to the toilet, to get up, to get dressed, shower or bathe, eat meals, cook, clean and go shopping. She lacks independent skills but the staff are trying to teach her to do things for herself. Jan is Jewish and celebrates her religion at the local synagogue with her family. She celebrates the main festivals such as Passover, Rosh, Hashanah, Yoksina, Sukkot and Hanukkah. Jan only eats kosher food. She also loves diet cola. She is currently learning about healthy diets and what to eat as she does not like fruit or vegetables and prefers chocolate and crisps as snacks. She is overweight due to her poor diet and needs support to make better choices without losing her independence of having a choice in her meals. Jan doesn't like getting a shower and often refuses to get a wash so needs lots of encouragement. She has full support with money management. Due to Jan's learning disability, she often has no concept of danger in her new home, with items such as wires, plug sockets, cooking equipment, the temperature of hot water in the tap, etc. and needs support in these areas. Jan is fully mobile and can walk. Jan's favourite activity is going out on her tricycle with her support worker. Jan has a shunt fitted which drains fluid from her brain. This sometimes gets blocked, gets blocked and is a medical emergency when it happens. So, 
what needs does Jan have? So she needs support to make better food choices as she only eats chocolate and crisps and does not like fruits or vegetables. She only eats kosher food because of her religion. Jan is overweight due to eating and drinking unhealthy food. She is currently learning about healthy food but needs support in doing this. She needs support in making good choices while trying to keep her independent. Jan has no concept of danger so needs support with areas in her house. She needs educating and safety like not, not answering the door. She also needs to be taught about the dangers of wires and shown how to use plug sockets, using cooking equipment and the temperature of the water in a safe way. Jan is Jewish and celebrates her religion at the local synagogue with her family, so she needs opportunities to go to the festivals such as Passover. She celebrates the main festival, so needs to make sure she knows what they are to keep her, and help to keep her safe. Jan needs prompting for personal care, so she needs prompting to go to the toilet, to get off, get dressed, showered, bathed, to, uh, to eat meals, to cook and to clean. Keep reminding Jan and motivate her to use the toilet and her to go independently. Teach her how to keep up with personal care to encourage independence in these areas. So Jan needs prompting to get up, get dressed, showered and bathed. She needs lots of encouragement to get washed and dressed. She needs motivating to get up and this could be by telling her what she could be doing during the day, you know, to attempt to get up, to make it exciting so that, you know, she likes riding a tricycle so you could use that, come on, you know, let's get up, let's get dressed, you know, the, the, the quicker you do that, you know, then you can get out on your bike. So Jan is fully mobile, she can walk and loves going out on her trike as we said earlier. She has a shunt fitted which drains fluid from her brain and this sometimes gets blocked and is a medical emergency if this happens. A support worker goes out with her when she rides her trike and Jan needs ongoing supervision to support her if her shunt gets blocked. So you've listened to um, to Jan and um, you know listened to the ideas and, and what the needs are for Jan. So what you need to do now, you need to read the following four, like I said earlier on, the child one Valentina, child two Jeremy, and the adult Moses, and the elderly adult um, Doris. And what you need to do, you need to describe using at least these three sentences, the emotion, emotional needs of each of those, and the, um, the physical needs using three sentences of each as well. So you'll see in your workbooks, you've got Valentina, and then you've got a page where you can write your sentences for each of the emotional and physical needs and the same for Jeremy, Moses and Doris. Um, and that just brings us um, to the end of the, the chapter and just to go over the aims and objectives once more. So throughout that session you um, should have described skills and qualities needed to give personal care, identify procedures relating to personal care, explain why procedures relating to personal care must be followed and you've looked at the case studies and described the personal and emotional needs of each of the individuals of the varying age groups of the children and the adults and that's the end of the chapter thank you